for children's church. We have some beautiful children. Before I get ready to open up the Word of God, I want to draw your attention to a few things. Um, the last few weeks in the bulletin, we put a bookmark. We didn't put it in this week, but on the back table, we have a whole bunch more. Feel free to take these. These talk about five areas, five core areas that are part of our core values that we want you to pray for every day, every week. Okay, There are five simple areas that we're trying to strive towards. The first one is that God will be honored in our lives, our family, and our nation. How many people know that's big? The second one is that we would have a love for souls and that we'd have the boldness to reach them. How many people know that's huge? The third one is that the care groups, these little Bible studies would multiply and grow. Let me just say this. There is no strong church that doesn't break down into little units where people can get to know each other, where people's gifts can be used. And so we want to develop, um, everybody say oodles and bunches, a variety of different kinds of cell groups where people could get together, become friends. Everybody say, that's not a bad F word. Say friends is good, to be friends, okay? And, um, and so that's our goal, that they grow and multiply. And the fourth one is that we would learn how to reach out in practical ways to people that we would be the heart and the soul of this community. That when people think of Victory Assembly of God, they remember how we visited their grandmother, remember how they vote, brought food to somebody who lost their job. Let me tell you something, we're not that yet, but we're going there, can you say amen? And if we every day would pray for that, it will become a reality. And the fifth one is that God will give us wisdom in our lives, our family, our church, and our nation. One of the things what I did, I, I took each of these prayer requests and I went in depth to describe how to pray for them a little, um, a little fuller. And um, you can go on the web and you can download it on the right hand side. But for some of you people that don't like to go on the web, I made like 25 copies or in the back um, table. You could just pick one up. And um, I, want, I want to encourage you to pray. And so these are just tools that I believe will be helpful. Can I ask you a question? How many people believe that bugs should be outside, not inside? You know, how many people know that when you come in my house, if you're a little creature crawler, watch out. I have mercy on bugs outside, but you come in my domain. You start crawling on my kitchen floor and you're in trouble. I'm only kidding. You. Okay, but listen to me. How many people here have ever marveled at the end? Even Solomon, the wisest man, marveled at the ant. Did you ever look at an ant? Did you ever? And I'm talking about like a colony of ants. How many people know? How many people know? Ants are jigging. Man, they get into it. They, they, they work together and they function together. And um, I remember one day, maybe you might think I'm too, um, I have too much time on my hand. But one day I was, I was outside and I was looking down and I saw, I saw this leaf. It was about this big. It was like this big. It was giant. It was about the size of my dog. No, this, no. It was about this big, this leaf. And, um, and I saw a bunch of ants carrying it. And I was like... Teensy, weensy, insy, bitsy little ants. And they were carrying this big leaf. How many people have ever seen something like that? And you know how they did that? They worked together. They worked in harmony. They worked in unity. They, you know what? Somebody was the leader, and they didn't have a title or a badge. But together, they carried that, that leap. And that's what, that's, what, um, that's what ants do. They work together. And it sort of illustrates my message. The title of my message is Unity plus prayer, plus purpose, equals power. Say that with me. Unity, plus prayer, plus purpose, equals power. Now, how many people believe that? No, some of you say you believe it, but you don't. Let me tell you something. If you believe that unity, plus prayer, plus purpose, equals power, you would order your life to cherish unity. 
You wouldn't hold grudges against people. You wouldn't allow yourself to get bitter. You wouldn't allow bad thinking about people. Why? Because when you're in conflict with people, when you're, when you're, uh, when you're disappointed and you let your disappointments rise to capture your heart, you sift your life of the power of God. But unity plus what? Plus what? Purpose. Equals power. power. Now, I'd like to read a scripture from the Genesis uh, chapter 11. It's about the Tower of Babel. The, everybody in the whole world, and this is in the very beginning of time, they all spoke the same language. And it came about as the, the people were a group, one group, and they, they found the plane, and, and, and they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And use these bricks for stone. And they used tar and mortar. And they said, this is what they said in verse 4. Come, let us build ourselves a city and tower. A city and tower who reach to the heavens. I want you to hear this again. Come, let us build for ourselves. Come, let us build for ourselves a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. What were these people interested in doing? They were interested in making a name for themselves. They weren't interested in making a name for God, making a name for God's kingdom. They were interested in self-exhortation. And then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of man had built. And he said, Behold, they are one people. They have the same language. And this is what they began to do. Now listen. And nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. So God said, Let us go down. Confuse their language. They will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them aboard over the face of the earth. Therefore its name was called Babel because the Lord confused their language over the whole earth. And from here, the Lord scattered them aboard. What's the story about? It's a story about the power of unity. They were unified in language, purpose, and all their energies. Their, their goals and their energies were going in the same place to build a name for themselves. And God says, nothing they purpose will be impossible for them. It's the truth. Even ungodly heathen, if they unite, they're unstoppable. How much more those who love God and are filled with the Spirit. We see this in the positive way, borne out in, in the book of Acts. Now you have to understand, the book of Acts were a bunch of rag-picking fishermen that Jesus called. And he used them to change the world. Why? He got them on the same page. He got them in prayer. And he got them putting their energies for the same purpose. Is there a hallelujah in the house? It says in Acts chapter 114, These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. They were with one mind, continually praying. When the day of Pentecost came, they were in one accord in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. And what happened? The power of God came in. Oh, strong, mighty wind. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoken tongues. How did that happen? They were in one accord. In Acts 2, 46, it said they continued daily one accord. If they didn't just start in, in unity, they continued in unity in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate together. They fellowshiped together. They had simplicity of heart. Hallelujah. And the Bible says in verse 47 that in that kind of environment, it says people were being saved every day. Does anybody want some of that? How many people love to rejoice with people coming to Christ? I want some of that. Hallelujah. It says in Acts chapter 4, 32, the con and the congregation of those who believed were one heart and soul. 5, 12, it says at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among them, for they were all with one accord in Solomon's port. What are they saying? They're saying that unity and prayer 
and energy and purpose is unstoppable. Can you say amen? And we see that literally the whole known world heard the gospel. Um, Acts 5.14, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and, and were added to their number. Acts 6.7, the word of God spread and the numbers increased rapidly and a large number of priests came obedient to faith. And over and over in the book of Acts, it says in Acts 16.5, so the church was strengthened in faith and grew daily, daily in number. Why? Because they were in unity. Why? Because they had the same core values to share the gospel. Why? Because all of them gave their energies to building the house of God. Why? Because unity plus prayer plus purpose gives power. You know, you wonder where's the power? Somebody say, where's the power? I'll tell you where the power, the power when people are unified, the power is where people join in prayer, the power of people put their energies towards the same purpose, someone say amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God is not calling you to sit on your tuchus. That's the Jewish word for but. Hallelujah. God is not calling you to sit on your tuchus in the kingdom of God. He's calling you to get involved. He's calling you to do something for Jesus Christ. He's calling us together to do something for God. You can quote me on that. Everybody say, I vey. What's the pastor talking about? Let me tell you something. Explosive growth, people getting saved, the gospel going forth triumphantly, deep fellowship, people being loved and cared for and used and valued came when they were in unity and prayer and purpose. I want you to know that the Roman government couldn't stop them. I want you to know the devil couldn't stop them. Why? Because when we're together, when we're praying, when we have God's core values, it's undeniable. We are undefeatable. We're unstoppable. We're a holy terror to the enemy of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you get a church where everybody just comes to get a little bit of Jesus. Look good. Hallelujah. It doesn't scare the devil that we come together. It, it scares the devil when we pray together. It scares the devil when we join together. It, it, it scares the enemy. It scares him out of his heebie-jeebies when we're willing to get the same values, Bible values, to win the lost, to love the poor, to help out those in need. And when we join together, someone say amen. amen. Hallelujah. We give the devil a, a hairy conniption fit. Look that up in your dictionary. Hallelujah. Now, I want to narrow this down a little bit to different people, groups, pe different stations in people's lives. Okay, I, I am 52 years old right now. And I'm looking pretty good for 52, okay? I, and, but I wasn't always 52, and I wasn't always married with children. I remember I got married when I was 27, and I grew up early. I grew, how many people here grew up too soon, too quick? And so I didn't get married until I was 27 years old. And I remember as a single, I actually helped oversee a fairly big singles ministry, college and career and singles ministry. And I remember as a single seeing how many singles didn't have the power. Come on, you know singles. How many people here know a whole bunch of single people? Does anybody here hunt? Are there any hunters here? We, a few. Jake, you're a hunter. Everybody, all animals love us. Look at that. Stare Jake down. Look at that. You cool little man. No. Okay. Hey, Jake, tell me if I'm not you. Okay. I, if I had a shotgun, okay, and I was standing back there and I, I shot, pulled the trigger, I could probably hit 50 people here. Could hit a few. I wouldn't kill anybody probably. I, but I could hit a whole bunch of them, okay? And if I had a 22, however, Jake, watch out. Now you know how that little deer, cute deer feels. But if I had a 22, the difference between a shotgun and a 22, a shotgun goes over here, over here, over here. They do all this kind of stuff. And let me tell you something. In the kingdom of God, too often we're like shotguns. We put our times and our energy in this and this and this and that. And we never do anything significant. 
where God is calling us to be a 22. And very often, singles are like shotguns, a little over here, a little. They're not focused on any high ideals. They don't get the word of God for their lives. They don't get the purpose of God for their lives. I remember this principle working in my life as a single. I decided that I wasn't going to run after this and run after this. You know, when you're single, you have so many things that you want and so many things that you need and dreams that you had that aren't being fulfilled and desires that stood. And I said, no, I am going to set my heart after God and I'm going to let Him bring my dreams and my desires together. I had to be unified with God if I was going to be fruitful. Does that make any sense? You have Jesus in your life, but are you unified with Jesus as a single person? Are your will and your desires Jesus' will and Jesus' desire for you? That was weak. If as a single, you'll put your prayers and your core values and your energies in line with Jesus's, you'll be blessed and fruitful. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. Somebody say, preach it, Pastor. Preach it good. Okay. I'm in a rowdy mood. Watch out. Sorry. It says in 1 Corinthians 7, 32, but I want you to be free from concerns. One who is unmarried, meaning single, is concerned about the things of the Lord. That's how it should be. How he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of this world. How he may please his wife. <laughs> Love you, Jerry. Okay. That's our church. Um, and his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and a virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord. That she may be holy both in body and spirit. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you. You know, this is not a law. He's not, he's not saying this to bind people into a certain, certain way. He's saying, I'm saying this for your benefit. And the person who wrote this was also single, the Apostle Paul. He says, I'm saying this for your own benefit. Not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate. Now listen, and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Un Say that with me, undistracted devotion. How do you, the New King James put it, without distraction. You know, if you as a single person become undistracted, distracted with your devotion to God, Hallelujah. And you'll take on his prayers. Ask him. Seriously. As a signal. Say, Lord, help me to pray the prayers that you want me to pray. And Lord, what are the core values I need to internalize in my soul? And if you'll pray the prayers he wants you to do. And then if you'll join with a community of people of like-minded singles that will pray prayers together. And go after certain core values. I want you to know. You will be happy, healthy, and fruitful. And then if God ever has you married, you won't go as an empty, miserable person looking for someone else to meet your need. You go fulfilled with the grace of God. Does that sound good? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Three of you do. Thank you. Many Christians, let's be honest, many Christians, they wonder in their, their life, where's the abundance and joy I heard about? When I came to Christ, happy, happy, snappy, happy, Jesus, smile, hallelujah. Where is that? Let me tell you this. The joy of the Lord is not in half-hearted Christianity. The joy of the Lord is not in doing your own thing and serving your own kingdom. The joy of the Lord is, is, is practicing undistracted devotion to the Lord. It's being in unity with your Savior. It's serving His kingdom and following His desire and, and running after His will. That, you guys got to get alive. Hallelujah. I want you to experience it. But if you want to experience that joy, you need to make it your joy to do God's will. You need to pray the prayers He wants you to pray. And you need to put your energies into building His kingdom and serving His people. And you will experience overflowing joy. Now that I picked on the singles, 
every married person, I'm about ready to set my sights on you and talk about you. Now, how many people know that there is a whole slew of marriages that are falling apart? I want you to know the loneliest place in the whole world is when you're, when you're married to somebody who used to be your best friend and you're not even talking anymore. That is a dark hole from hell. But now, the first verse in the Bible about marriage, it says, the two shall become. You know what our problem is? Which one am we going to become? Come on, you know that's true. When you get married, I told all new couples, I said, everybody's going to have a year of hell. And that year of hell comes when you're trying to figure out which one you're going to become. The husband says, well, I'm the head of the house. And, um, and the woman says, yeah, you go to somebody else's house if that's good. Now the husband needs to be the head of the house. I believe that. But how many two people know the two becoming one is not becoming him and it's not becoming a her, it's becoming an us. There, let me tell you something. When the two become one and it's just to him or it's just to her, that's slavery. That's slavery. Right. You didn't marry that person so you could have a slave. Let me tell you something. It'd be cheaper to go out and find a slave than to marry somebody to be your slave. Come on. You marry that because you love the person. Well, why do you want them to stop being that person? In fact, my goal is to let my wife be more Maria than she ever was. I want her to be... Hallelujah. The two shall become one. Now, very often in marriage counseling, I tell couples, I say, a lot of couples try to get the close like this. And when you try to get the close together like this, you're going to butt heads. You know what this philosophy is? It's 50-50. Has anybody ever heard that marriage is 50-50? That is the worst advice anybody could give you. Marriages that begin 50-50 end quickly in divorce. Because guess what? If it's 50-50, it's 50 your best. How many people are you not always your best? And so you give 50, they give 50. Well, guess what? You ain't feeling too good today. I ain't giving my 50. I'm giving 40. Well, she looks at you and you're only giving 40. She says 35. You look at her 35, you already a little PO'd at her for giving, giving just 50 because you wanted her to give 100. You wanted to be yours all the time, do everything you ever wanted to think. You wanted to read your mind. And so now she's pulling back. Well, then you pull back. How many people have seen that in some people's lives? It's from the pit of hell. Let me tell you some marriage is 100% 100 all the time. 100% 100%. And the only way to have a good marriage, hallelujah, is not to get close like this. It's to get close like this. It's each of you are seeking the Lord. Each of you are desiring His will. Each of you are hungering after God. Each of you are learning more how to be the man or the woman God's called you to be. Let me tell you something. That's a three-pronged cord that cannot be divided. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And so, yes, the two shall be one, but which one? It's us. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. What about families? Families need to be in unity. A families that pray together, say together. But it's not just prayers. You need to make sure that you're in unity. Some of you need to make it your goal this year as a family to get out of debt. That means one can't be saving and the other spending. That means you need to get together and you need to come up with a plan and you need to pray about it. But you need to, you need to use wisdom in your life. Is there a hallelujah? Is there a help me in the house? Hallelujah. But you know, one of the biggest goals of a family is to raise godly children. I love Malachi. So God hates divorce. You know why he hates divorce? Because he's looking for godly children. That's what it says. Okay. You're, you're, primary, you're a parent. Your primary 100% goal is to raise godly kids. How many people know it takes, it takes unity to raise godly kids? If you're trying to do one thing and your spouse is trying to go in a different way, it doesn't work. You need to come into agreement about the standards in your household. Hallelujah. And let me just say this. You know, a lot of times in our society, we're trying to raise famous children. We're trying to raise um, um, talented football players or dancers or, or culinary experts. Let me tell you something. We all want our kids to be successful. But your highest goal needs to be raise godly children. Because guess what? If they become that football star, if they become, you know, the, if they win that cake baking contest, 
or the pageant contest, the beauty pageant contest. And they're not godly, it's all in vain. And our, our greatest goal, you need to be unified that your greatest goal for your children, you need to work and pray that you have a godly, godly family. And then at the, as a church, let me tell you something. I'm giving my life that we have a godly church. And I'm asking you to join me. I don't want to have a nice little cute church where, where you know, people think it's cute to be here. How many people know a lot of churches are just nice to be part of? I want a church that's radically changing the whole world. I want a church that's loving the unlovable. I want a church, I want to, you know, someday I'd like our church to have a hospital for people and senior citizen stuff. I want, I want to think outside the box. I want people to know that Victory Assembly of God, that we're, we're the bee's knees in the cat's pajamas. I mean, we're the, I want them to see Jesus. When, when they look at Victory, I want them to see Jesus. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? I want them to see Jesus. That's only going to happen as we all have the same core values. As we all have to put our energies to seeing the kingdom of God built here. It's only going to happen as we, we pray these things. Now I, I shared with you, we have these bookmarks out at the table. And I, we have this big sheet. I'm going to read some of the things about how to pray these core values. The first core value is that the Lord will be honored in our lives, our family, and the church. And as individually, oh God, we pray. And you, you, could, you could read this, but you could also get printed this out from the website or in the back. But we pray, oh God, that you would be crowned as Lord our God, that you'd be crowned as a holy king in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would be honored with our time, talent, and treasure, oh God. Join me in this. We pray that, that we would put you above all other loves, that we would seek you first, that we would obey your word quickly, and Lord, we obey your word absolutely. Lord, we pray that we live a holy, consecrated life. And for our families, Lord, we pray that a home will be a place where God's authority and presence reigns. If you want that, say amen. We pray that our homes, our families, we pray where we love and respect one another. Father, that you would, that the fathers in our households would take their place as spiritual leaders and lovers. That the children will be mentored in godly character and Christian virtue. And Lord, for our church, we pray that you would be enthroned as Father and the Son as Supreme King. We pray that we would honor you by how we reach out to the poor, Lord. That, that, that we would honor you by obeying your word. Lord, that, that the whole body would be called to consecration and holiness. And that we would be a home and a family for love for the lonely and the needy, Lord. That we would be a, a home for the lonely and the needy. Can you imagine if everybody prayed those prayers every week for their families, for their lives, and for the church? And in the, in the sheet that you can get from the website or in the back, um, I have scriptures for each one of these. The second core value that we need to join together, we need to in unity be praying about and, and working toward is, Oh, Lord. I pray that you'd give us a love for souls and a boldness to reach them. That our eyes would be open to see the lost, that they're on their way to hell. That we would see that Jesus is their only hope of salvation. Lord, I pray that we'd be relentless with our prayers and sharing. That we would not rest or tire until our family, friends, co-workers, and neighbors come to Christ. Lord. That we would build bridges, oh God, of friendship and love with those who you're opening their hearts to. Lord, I pray that we would believe that God is anointing us to share the gospel. Can you say amen to that? The th third core value that we need to get behind, that we need to be praying, is that small, small groups, care groups, would blossom and grow. And I can't encourage you to join one. Let me tell you something. If you can't find one that fits into your life schedule, the, write down what will. Maybe somebody says, you know, I get off work at 3 o'clock in the morning and I got to go to work at 10 o'clock. Can we start a cell group at 3.30? I'm not going to join it. But guess what? There might be somebody else that needs a prayer group at 3.30 in the morning and we can figure it out. 
that small groups, my prayer is that small groups will become huge in our church. These are some of the prayers, oh Lord, that we'd be a place of real relationships and real devotion and real responsibility in our church. That pastoral care and follow-up would be facilitated by the small group and the people in them. That God would give the leaders a pastor's heart for their people in their cell. That these care groups would function like a fishing net to catch souls for Christ. Someone say, well, who? That the leaders would be raised up from within their groups and that these groups will multiply. Hallelujah. The fourth core value we have that we're praying for this year is that care ministries will spring forth with power and love. Let me just tell you this. I believe that we need to be the heart and the soul of this community. I believe when people look at Victory Assembly of God, they need to have something pop in their mind, how one of you guys reached out and touched somebody. I think, Victory Assembly of God, somebody from your church brought me over dinner. Victory Assembly of God, somebody from your church came over and prayed for me. Victory Assembly of God, somebody helped us meet a need. Amen. And that's our goal. We need to pray that care ministries would spring forth with power and love. We need to start praying that, that we as a church would be known for our good deeds. That we would show Christ's love in practical ways. That we would see people's needs and meet them. How many people really don't want to see other people's needs? Well, my prayer is that you see their needs and that it bugs you. I pray that you'd be haunted by seeing other people's needs. I pray that you would be delivered from your stinking laziness. Hallelujah. How do you do stinking? Lousy laziness, that's good. Um, I pray that we would be an oasis of love for our community. I pray that God would make us a soul of our community by reaching people with his love. And that serving others would become our hobby and our joy. Think about that phrase. That serving others would become our hobby. And the last thing that we need to get behind that God would do. What, what's the principle? What's the, the principle of this message? That unity plus, plus equals. And I'm giving you these five purposes. And the fifth purpose is that wisdom would flow in our lives, our family, and our church, and our leaders. And these are some prayers to pray. And just on that printout, they actually print out the different ministries and the people that lead them. It says, Lord, teach us to order our time, finances, and relationship according to your wisdom. Lord, guide and bless the families at Victory. Lord, grant that the singles in our church would find godly friends and have a heart to serve. Lord, teach us how to have wisdom with, and, and, how, and how we relate and treat our parents, our spouses, and children. How many people have older parents that you still need wisdom how to relate to them? How many have children and you need wisdom to relate to your children? Okay. Wouldn't it be cool if everybody was praying that over all the families in our house? Lord, teach us how to train our children in the ways of the Lord and how to give them loving, godly discipline. Lord, lead the leaders of victory to hear your voice and do your will. Give us wisdom to keep your heart and priorities at the center of our church. Guide us and those involved with making decisions as we move forward on building victory's church home. Amen. Say it with me, unity, unity. plus prayer, plus, prayer. plus purpose. Equals power. If you lack the power that comes from F A I T H A A, what do you say? If you lack the power of faith, it's because you're not in unity, you're not in prayer, and you're not going after the purposes of the people God called alongside of you. I believe God wants us to be the powerful. The power comes out of unity. Hallelujah. The next few weeks, I think I'm going to be teaching a little bit on unity and how to keep the unity. And I'm going to be sharing some of the stupid things churches do to inhibit unity. Hallelujah. I'm going to be stepping on some of your toes. Woo! 
Woohoo! You better, if you have steel tipped shoes, you better wear them the next few weeks. No, I'm just kidding you. Hallelujah. How many people want to be unity together? Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's stand. Can we sing that song, Carl? Hallelujah. And Rachel. Yes, God. Hallelujah. Single minded, whole hearted, one thing I ask of you, Jesus. Single minded, yeah, as we sing this song, if you want personal prayer, come to the altar, feel free. One thing we love to pray I for you. ask of you, Jesus. That I may gaze upon your beauty, O Lord. That I may seek your holy face. That I may know you in an intimate way. And follow to you all of my days. Mind. Single minded, whole hearted. One thing I ask of you, Jesus. Single minded, whole hearted. One thing I ask. Find your beauty, O oh Lord, that I may seek your holy face, that I may know you in an intimate way, and follow after you all of my days. All of life comes down to just one thing That's to know you, oh Jesus And make you known All of life comes down to just one thing That's to know you, oh Jesus And make you 